I'd like to welcome everybody to a brand new edition of the Adam King Show. I'm your host, Adam King, joined by the one and only Rock Breath. Welcome. We have an incredible show in store for you today. We are going to be joined by crypto mega player, lawyer, entrepreneur, mm-hmm. tech genius, Adam Gordon King. Einstein. Is Gordon Inside Einstein this episode is Crypto Law Partners. And to I'm just going to say everything Einstein because yeah. Gordon is an absolute renaissance man. If I were to call myself a renaissance man, which I do believe I am, I look to Gordon as somebody in my world who is absolutely a renaissance man. Um, So before we get into all the nitty gritty stuff, um, you know, I want to say for my audience a little bit about you and, and, and what you do and where we met. And, you know, I've been blessed to have you in my life for, you know, I don't even remember how long ago. Happy hour. I, I think we're creeping up on a decade, if not more. We, we certainly are. You know, I became we're talking about happy hour mafia. It started in Happy Hour Mafia, which was before a small world. You know, that was like the original small world of Los Angeles was Happy Hour Mafia. And it was founded by none other than this man right here, Gordon Einstein. And Mm. Happy Hour Mafia was like a club at Happy Hour. And it was like the biggest deal in L.A. for like how many how many it was a once a month party. What was the final number that you got to do? You know, I did 40 of them. 40 of them. And and some of these were up to, huh, this is an interesting interview topic. Uh, some of them were up to 200 or 250 people. They were amazing. They were, they were great. It was, you know, and they were charity supporting and they had some intellectual content. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you, I don't know if you remember the invitations, but they were not, they were not your normal invitations. They were actually not at all. thoughtful. Very thoughtful. You know? And there was and, always like something that it was benefiting, but they yeah. were really some of the best parties ever. And, you know, L.A. has uh, uh, there's never been a scene in L.A. like the Happy Hour Mafia scene. In all my yeah. experience, being a part of every social scene that ever existed in L.A., and the, it was really the quality of the people that would come. And and you were the host, and back then you were the president of the IP Bar Association, I believe. Am I right? Oh, for for like a, for like a flat minute. For a flat minute, I rem- I just yeah. remembered that about you. You know, like, and then we were friends, and we were always social. We never. We never went into business. Our, our relationship never ventured into business. And then as crypto began to blow up, I watched mm. you blow up with it. And your public profile has just gone through the roof. And then I remember, mm. you know, all the different things you were doing, your fitness campaign. You were like my source of inspiration. You were bigger than Andrew Tate on uh, out there in the world you know, you were killing it for everybody in your world. And and it was so inspiring to watch you create crypto, go from adaptive sky to Gordon, uh, to, to crypto, uh, to crypto law partners. And um, maybe you could give a little bit of background about yourself for our audience so that they could hear first from you. Sure. I'll I'll just kind of start from the beginning, the the, the real beginning. So I'm I'm a Los Angeles native was, was born there. Uh, My dad was a, Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Air Force. So shortly after being born, I grew up a little bit in Virginia because he was stationed at the Pentagon. So you can hear, I don't have the quite 100% standard Los Angeles accent. Mm-hmm. And then um, after Pentagon, we, we moved back to Los Angeles because he's working at the Rand Corporation. So yeah. I mostly grew up in Los Angeles. I went to law school in L.A. at USC. So technology was always a part of your family. Kind of. My, 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 da- my dad was into personal computing. This is back in the you know, 70s and 80s. I'm dating myself. Um, I took all my bar mitzvah money and bought an Apple II Plus. That's I didn't so have cool. any money left over for games, but you know, I had the computer, so that was something. Um, you know, if you remember Ultima and all that yeah. fun stuff. The, uh, I've always been interested in technology. The, it, it's more recently that I became a hobbyist programmer in Python. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't wouldn't call myself a real developer, but I do, I do it for fun. And practiced estate planning, business, and tax for a while. Then I broke off from law and started my own um, company, Adapter Sky, which you mentioned. That's a hosted desktop solution for law firms. And then well, we can dive into this, but I discovered uh, crypto, blockchain, and Bitcoin in 2014 in mm-hmm. Ukraine of all places. Interesting. And it, that, that's a good story. But the, And then I realized... I always say my, my major epiphany was two things. And this area, blockchain crypto, needed law. 
but much more strongly, I realized that law needed blockchain and crypto. Mm. In other words, for law to be made, made better, it needed access to these new tools. Actually, um, that's know. such a great point that you made. I went ahead mm. and asked a bunch of the big crypto players in my world uh, mm. to give me some questions for you. And some of the questions were was pertaining to that exactly. We'll get to that in the second half of the segment. But that sure. crypto, that law needs crypto for its advancement, which is... Mm. You know, very interesting. So, but continue, please. Sure. So then I, I, I had this epiphany and I came back and I talked to my employees at Adapter Sky and said, look, I'm, I'm going back into law because I want to work on this revolution. So, you know, big decision whether you're going to support me because I can always shut down Adapter Sky or I can keep it going. And, you know, while I do this, and they're like, no, no, we, we couldn't stop you even if we wanted to, <laughs> which is true. Then, and so since 2000, you know, it was a, about a year of switching, but 2015 or so, let's say, uh, I started doing law again and having an exclusive focus on crypto and blockchain and just for an international audience. In for, 2015, for, you're saying? Yeah, early. Wow. Very OG lawyer in this area. That's why That's I got kind crazy. of crazy. Um, and I, something interesting happened, which is I had always had a deep fear of public speaking I was never very good at it. I had a speech impediment, um, some spiritual psychological blocks against it, if you like, but I couldn't accomplish what I wanted to accomplish without getting up on the stage. Mm -hmm. So I would force myself to get on the stage and, and speak in public again and again and again, Right. as, as nerve wracking and soul destroying as it felt. And finally got slightly less nervous than less nervous than I remember certain cracking a couple of jokes on stage. Hmm. Now, I mean, I was just on stage last night. Now you can't get me off the freaking stage. I love doing interviews. I love talking. I love being, you know, messing with people. Yeah. Like I'll, I'll get out there and, I, and it, it, I'll just get on the stage and I'll, and I'll just rip at people, you know, because I want direct answers. I want to deliver value for the audience. And when people are providing valuable stuff, I facilitated it when they're being a little, you know, waving this way or that way. I'm just, I'm using my deposition skills <laughs> yeah. to get to the truth. So I, I love public speaking now. So I, I say, you know, that's a, you know, when you first met me, you know, happy hour mafia, what, what we can talk about is when we first met, that, that was sort of me using being an event organizer as a crutch for the fact that I was a little socially shy. Yeah. You know, you know, it's, it's easier to, be, to meet people if you're organizing the event, you have a thing to immediately exactly. talk about, like, you know, are, you can walk up to them and say, Hey, I'm the organizer. Are you having a good time? Want to just make you make sure you're being taken care of, and that's a natural conversation starter. Interesting. So you don't have, you don't need to be creative. You can just do that. Um, because you were also so, such a good host. You know, it was it's interesting to hear that now, looking back at those years, because you were such an amazing host, and no one would have ever yeah. thought that it was like a overcoming a social impediment. Well, it it it, it certainly was. I mean, well, everything. Half the stuff I don't, I, I do, I don't know why I did it at the time. Then I look back, I'm like, oh, if I had been thinking about it, that's what I would have been thinking. Right. <laughs> you know, and then some stuff I do for multiple reasons. Most of my best life choices have been pure instinct and mm. pure impulsive, fast instinct. Um, and it ends up being right in retrospect. Mm. So the Happy Air Mafia thing was, you know, why need social circle, you know, working on social anxiety. Um really wanting to support charity, really wanting to get my friends together. It was also an efficiency thing because, you know, rather than going to 20 different places to meet 20 different friends, why not do one event and have them meet each other and hang <laughs> exactly. out? You know, it's yeah. just time management. There's all these good reasons. So the, yeah, that's super. So just kind of wrapping up the, the crypto thing, you know, I, I've had a successful international practice and I was based in Los Angeles, though going to Ukraine, obviously, is, you know, quite a lot. Um, I didn't but, know that your history with Ukraine started that early. Oh yeah, well, just just real fast anecdote. So for Adapter Sky, I was displaying a legal tech. I think it was in 2014 in New York. We got a booth, we got everything else, and this Ukrainian couple came up to this booth, not my booth, but the booth next to mine, and they're speaking in Russian. And I've always had a thing for the Russian language. You probably know that. Yeah. So we started talking, got to be really good friends, spent some time together in New York, and then it turned out that these were the founders of Distributed Lab. Pavel Kravchenko and Lily Kravchenko. I then invited them to stay with me in Los Angeles at my place. So if you can picture the scene, you know, nice, good-sized apartment, big couch. We're watching that TV show Sherlock with Benedict Cumberland, Cumberland, whatever his name is. 
I'm making steak, I'm pouring them wine, and they go, Gordon, have you ever been to Ukraine? And I hadn't been out of the country, not counting Mexico, for 25 years. I'm like, no. You know, and they're like, you should come. You should come to Odessa. Let us show you, you know, pictures wow. of it. And I looked at it, I said, okay, I'll come. I didn't have a passport. I hadn't left the country for 25 years. They didn't really believe me. But I addressed all those things. And next thing you know, I'm in Odessa, Ukraine. You know, you know, think about it. You know, silly American doesn't leave the country for 25 years, then goes right after the Maidan revolution in Ukraine, goes right to Odessa. Right. Where you can still see the customs house that was in flames. Wow. But because I did this, they organized a conference to keep me happy at Blockchain Incredible Party, BIP. Mm -hmm. And so they brought all their friends down who were involved in crypto and blockchain to Odessa, Ukraine. And it was amazing. It, it really opened my eyes. And then Beautiful. you know, once once I got a taste of that, there was just no going back because you know Odessa is rich with history and all the beautiful I stuff. I actually, my first time that I ever went to Ukraine, I believe, was two thousand and three, mm -hmm. and I've been four oh, times. Wow. And I love Ukraine. First time I ever went to Ukraine, actually, I sailed from Istanbul to Odessa. Wow! It was an amazing, That's epic. It was so That's epic, epic, my friend. It was so epic. We got lost at sea. We got caught in a storm <laughs> and lost at sea. What I, kind of boat were you on? A cargo ship. Oh my God. You it's a short story. I'll tell you the story. So we sure. were in Israel and we wanted to walk the path of Rebbe Nachman. He went mm -hmm. from Israel to Uman where he passed away. So we were trying to like walk the walk the path. So he sa mm -hmm. sailed from Istanbul to Odessa. And I was reading this book about his life. So I was like, I'm gonna go sail from Istanbul to Odessa. We board the ship and the mm -hmm. ship. I went with like two of my guy friends, all Jewish. Mm -hmm. It's like a non-Jewish ship. Ironically, there was mm -hmm. they they sent us to a room. They gave us a cabin on the ship. It had four two bunk beds, and mm -hmm. one of the bunk beds. We get in the room, and there's a Jewish guy sitting there. We say, "What are you doing?" He said, "He said, what What are you doing here?" He says, "I'm going to walk the path of Rabbi Nachman." It was like. What is this? What are the coincidences and the chances? I still think to this day that he might have been like Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu and Avi, there to protect okay. us. So we get lost at sea and in the middle of the mm -hmm. night, because we're all, at that time, you remember me, I used to have the long payas and the long beard and everything. Oh, I so, remember. This you're, was you're, during, you're, you're, you're quite, you were quite the scene. A very eccentric you know? character at the happy hour. Oh, and, and, and by the way, we, we have a Chabad yarmulke. Just I want know. a Chabad of Dubai yarmulke. I need you to send me one of those. That's incredible. That's yeah, a collector's yeah, cool. item. Yeah. So uh, we got, we, they wanted to know what we were doing on the boat. So in mm. the middle of the night, this drunk Ukrainian guy knocks our door in. Mm. He's drunk. He's like, we, you're to come with me to the bar. We're like, what is this? This is kind of scary. Like we were in the middle of a storm. It was like, it was wild storm. The ship was going side to side. Mm -hmm. He said, Which they're not the letting me actually to go to the bar. Yeah, he's like, they're not letting me come to the bar until I bring back the Jews with me to the bar. This is what he says. So we're like, we're kind of screwed. We have nothing to do. We go down to the bar. And mm -hmm. in the bar scene, it's like total mafia on the cargo ship. And mm -hmm. uh, like this, the, the music, the, like it was like a, a scene from a movie. And mm -hmm. these three Hasidic guys with long payas and beards walk into like, everybody's got gold chains. There was guns. Mm -hmm. It was like a scene that they they needed to know who we were because there was something on the ship that we weren't supposed to be on that ship. Mm. And uh, the music was playing and I ended up jumping on a table and started dancing. They had like cookers and prostitutes and strippers everywhere. And I just started this dancing. I just, I just started dancing and throwing a party and the, the main boss, he looked at me and he's like, you know, these Jews aren't so bad after all. And we stayed with them the whole time. We got lost at sea with them. And we, when we pulled into Odessa, everybody was required to stay in our rooms. Armed guards with AK-47s came on the boat, took off cargo after cargo after cargo. And then we sure. were finally allowed to leave the boat. So I don't know what it was, but it was a, a trip for the ages. And I, and I, and I loved Odessa. Uh, I, I know. You know, there's a, you know, there's a Russian mafia comedy skit on YouTube. I never saw like, it. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll send you like, this, this is like this. It's like, you know, basically, you know, this guy, this guy goes, this reminding me, he goes to Russia on, on like a school trip and he gets adopted by these mafia guys. He's like, I am the machine. <laughs> it's, it's really well. Okay. Well, anyways, you know, was, and finally, you know, the, the teacher tries to get him in trouble and they're like, you know, I'm not going to use the word, but like, look lady, this is Russia. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, 
they're, they're all friendly. You know, I never had a problem. You know, they, they were, you know, it was I, I attributed to the Russian character because they were truly doing something illegal on the boat. And mm. these strangers happened to pop up on the boat. And like once they saw that we weren't a problem, they didn't care. Mm. It was like, whatever. Enjoy the party, you know? Yeah. And it was uh, it was great. That was my first experience with Ukraine. And mm. um, God, but is Ukraine not made out of pastels? I mean, like you look at the landscape and the countryside and all the beauty of the country. It's like the whole country is made out of pastels. I I I don't want to get I don't want to get into Ukraine because it's a hot mess. I want peace for the people of Ukraine and I want peace for the region and for the whole world and and that it's such a beautiful, rich country, you know, the people and the culture that uh, it deserves mm -hmm. peace to flourish. So we'll leave it Ukraine at that and pivot into other things. So you were yeah. in Ukraine, 2015. You, you 14, 15. I, I got exposed to crypto. I came back. I pivoted my career into law. Um, when did you make your I, first? When did you make your first purchase of Bitcoin? Uh, 2016, I think. 2016. Not immediately. Yeah, but did, did okay. Clearly. I'm now 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 I'm in now I'm in Dubai. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I think just to pick up where I left off, I was yeah. I was based in Los Angeles. I was doing a lot of international traveling. Mm -hmm. um i just to get a little bit personal so i i was married and then that that kind of fell apart for a variety of reasons you know, partly because of covid partly because of some other stuff but then at, when it was in, in death rose i was invited to dubai in the end of 2020 december um because a friend saw that i was not in the best shape um just because of covid so, and what was going on with the merch and all that other stuff and i went out to dubai the gyms were open Right. Crypto was happening. People were friendly. You know, mainly gyms were open because I, you know, gained way through the marriage and just through COVID. And I was like, okay, thank God. Came yeah. back, wrapped up some stuff. Uh, then ended up moving to Dubai end of February. Yeah. And that's when you saw the, the fitness kick start. Um, and it's been magic. Th this is there's so much entrepreneurial energy in this part of the world. It is when I see other YouTubers like talk down about the Middle East and say they don't have anything except for oil and they're going to be poor and they're stupid, I have to laugh. I mean, this is it is the city of the future. And Dubai doesn't have any oil, by the way. He gets his money from Abu Dhabi. So, you know, they're they're built on human activity and intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also you know, something that our, our audience really loves, the no taxes. Mm -hmm. I think that really oh, yeah. stimulates the economy. Well, it, they, remember, Americans are taxed on a global basis, but for everyone else, no taxes. Yes, the, the the best and the brightest um, come here. They have an entrepreneurial environment that's not like at home. They have personal safety. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, the especially for women, they can walk down the street anywhere and right. you're fine. Um, theft happens, but it's low. And if you're not stupid, you're generally safe. The people are hospitable. It, it, the, the, the way I put it is, look, okay, the, the government is what it is. Just, but if you, no one's no one's not here by choice. All right, so if you choose to come here, it's like choosing to go visit your friend in their mansion. Right. And the friend says, you know, while you're in my mansion, please observe these rules. Okay. Right. You don't need to be in my mansion. You know, you're you're free to go to anywhere you want. But if yeah. you if you're coming to my mansion where you're safe and being fed well and being protected and have all this opportunity, you know, here's some private doors. Please respect the fact that this is you know a private section of the house. Please don't swear. Please don't. Da, 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 da. You know. Please treat each other nicely. Even if even if you, someone else is next door to you, I have many guests in my mansion. You know, if, if the if the person in the room next to you isn't someone you would normally get along with, while you're in my house, at least be polite. Mm -hmm. And which to me makes complete sense. So I'm you know I'm in someone someone awesome generous person's mansion, right. and that person's letting me run a business out of here. The person's is letting me you know live life with my fiance here. You know, which is a you know, by the way, you know, things evolve quickly. Right. Mazel tov <laughs> to you and the uh super assassin. Yeah, you saw that, huh? Yeah, she's great. Um that you know, that's that's fantastic. You know, there's a and you know what other how strange I got in touch, more in touch, never was in, not in touch, but you know, was able to get a concerted touch with my Judaism here that's in so a Muslim beautiful. Arab country. That's it's such like a beautiful bizarre. story. It's a beautiful yeah, story it's for Jews and it's a beautiful story for Arabs that somebody can find their Jewishness inside of the Arab world. It's, yeah. it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's something that 
in the ancient world would have been accepted and for th over a thousand years, maybe even mm. 2000 years, uh, there's been so much animosity that to see a story like this, it's, it's really speaks volumes one for the ages that the, what, that one can discover their Judaism is inside of the, the kingdom. Um, so yeah, well, I, I mean, yeah, you, you, as, yeah, go sorry, ahead. I mean, I, as, as I'm sure you're well aware, there was large Jewish communities in most of these middle Eastern countries prior to the establishment of Israel. Yeah. And then that, 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 right or wrong exacerbated tensions between the yeah. local governments and populations and the Jews. And then you, you had um, Jews either choosing or being forced to flee to Israel or abroad. That, yeah. that, that's caused a multi-generational rift. Mm -hmm. And right, wrong, whatever, I'm not even talking about that, but just as a, as a fact, the, the Jews of these areas left. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Abraham Accords kicked in and then magically, in some places, it's restarting. It's it's like bizarre. It's like a the wheel of history has turned, yeah. and in a very surprising way. And the and it's 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 not a furtive community. It's it's actively integrating with the leaders and business people in this country, and they're collaborating. You know, it's, you know groups of Israelis and Jews are working with groups of Arabs here, Emiratis, and right. getting stuff done. It's kind of it's really neat. As a Jew abroad who's watching everything there, one cannot help but have tremendous admiration for His Highness uh, mm. Sheikh Mohammed ibn Rashid al Maktoum. And mm. he is truly a visionary. And mm. one can even argue that uh, maybe even the true leader of, you know, of the Arab people, the true visionary, the one who truly blazes the trail for all Arabs in all the other countries into the future, not just with his relationship with Israel and the Jewish people, but also with technology and with uh, upright civil society, uh, with uh, fairness of law, due process of mm -hmm. law. I mean, he's truly a, um, I know uh, uh, Salman uh, mm -hmm. Gets a lot of attention as like because he's you know king of Saudi Arabia and everything, Prince Salman and everything. But you know when you the uh, she Maktoum is Maktoum is is really a, a tremendous tremendous visionary. Have you spent time with him? No, not yet. Not yet. Not so, yet. Soon. Yeah, I, he he's he's on my calendar for early twenty twenty three. He just needs to know that I exist and and pencil yeah. me in. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. The, you know, it, it, there, there's layers and layers of relationships and families and shakes and his and her highnesses and excellencies here and massive commonality of names because the names are, you know, son of this and, and from this tribe and blah, blah, blah. So to parse that all out is a process. And the, the funny thing is you, you don't necessarily need... There, 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 there's certainly a model here where you add value, get noticed, and become aligned with or partner up with or advise the the royalty here. That's certainly a valid model. Um, because you know, if you want to get, it's funny, the the parsha for today for this week is you know, Joseph in Egypt, you know, seven years of uh, plenty of seven years of famine, like be an advisor to the pharaoh, right? If you want to get all religious. Well, so, you know, that, that that model is alive and well here. Where you can, you know, add your value as an advisor to the local government and structures, and go align with them and do well. That's that's one model, but there's you don't actually need. It's nice to have those connections, but you don't actually need those connections to be successful here. Mm -hmm. it, it it is as a friend of mine put in. It, it's funny. He's he's actually Iraqi. He, he put it that this is a hyper competitive meritocracy. Mm. Okay, wow. and you can have a you can have a beautiful life here. If you take the time, you build the relationships, you build trust, and you keep your nose clean, okay. And you you don't know you don't need to know this shake or that shake or blah 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 blah. You can you can be successful. Now th there is, you know, you don't need that. Now so that that's a valid path also. I, I I think the best way to proceed here is form. It's, it's all that you you can't lay back. You know, it's maybe someone who's born here who has all the connections because they went to right school could kind of lay back and get Habibi business, they call it, just because they the Habibi business. business. Like Yalla Habibi. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, Habibi, come to Dubai. Dubai. You know, I'm 
I'm here too late to develop that network from birth. Okay, you know, I, I don't have anything from birth, right? So, you know, I'm here in the 2020s, moving fast. So I think, I think you need to work really hard. You need to make yourself known. You need to respect gatekeepers, but also build up your brand so that people behind the gates reach out to you. Yeah. And through a combination of networking and hard work, you can get pretty far. To, to, your, to your other comment, Deb, I, re I really re respect the government here for what they've done and what their vision. You know, we, I think it's important to differentiate between UAE, the country, and then Abu Dhabi, the Emirate, and Dubai, the Emirate. They're each pursuing aligned but subtly different visions. And you know, some of them have oil wealth, some of them don't have oil wealth, and they're finding a way to live together because they really are like cantons of Switzerland. They really are semi-independent within this national system. Mm. And you know, M M MBS you know, has its pros and its cons. Okay. I, I'm not gonna rehash them all here, but I, I think everyone knows. But I think I think I think on a macro level, he was given a different hand to play than the leaders here. He's 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 wasn't necessarily the initial first choice for or his line wasn't the initial first choice for taking over the country. And that country is got a huge young population and a limited amount of oil. And he had to, and a certain family that he had to deal with. And, you know, he had to play a little bit rougher. And now he's played it rough. And now I think he's more focused on the future. So he's starting from a different place. I don't, I don't know if he's any better or worse. It's, it's hard to tell. I'm not, I'm not behind the scenes with these people. I, I don't know what the right. real conversations are. And I know I just, that I just know exactly. There's a yeah. tremendous happening behind the scenes as well. That is not in the public forefront. Yeah, ninety nine percent of it. And, and like, like I said, you know, if you, I, I don't come to the UA and think, you know, darn it, I deserve to know what's going on from you know, from before it happens. I'm in someone else. I'm in someone else's house. Right. I'm in someone else's family house. Okay. If the brother and sister or the dad and the son are going to go have a private conversation in some other room, you know, I, I wouldn't presume to like you know bang down the door and go, hey guys, what are you talking about? It's, yeah, exactly. it's not that kind of thing. And if you don't like it, leave. Leave. Okay. Again, this is an expatriate country. Ninety percent of the population is expatriate. If you don't like it, go. It, 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 it's, it's not. It's not like everyone here. Again, everyone here is here by choice, and there's a, there's a lot of personal freedom here. You know, there, there's there's a lot of freedom associated with walking. That I can leave. I can. It's the weirdest thing here. People hold on to tables. Like if you're going to a buffet and you want to hold on to your table by leaving their mobile phone on the table. That's so cool. Yeah. So, and you know, no, it, it's there. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's there when you get back. It's not even a question. You know, then in, in Proverbs, we learn that the blessing of abundance is acquired through peace. Peace yeah. is the greatest blessing of abundance. And just look around. I mean, they're killing it in every single field. They're killing it in Dubai. All my friends mm. that moved to Dubai are doing so well, better than they've ever done anywhere else. The mm. life, the culture, it's all blossoming and flourishing, and it's it's really exciting. So yeah. I want to move uh, uh, the conversation because we only have about an hour. So I want to sure. stay focused and get to some crypto questions because I, my audience is very into crypto. Some of them have gotten destroyed. Some of them have made <laughs> fortunes. I, I bet. Yeah. Some have gotten destroyed. But when I announced to the community, because we announced uh, – everybody coming on the show, a lot of people spoke up. A lot of people were excited. In fact, I had one friend who even said, I didn't get the actual, it's, he's in he's in Ireland, um, but uh, he said that he's in multiple groups with you, WhatsApp groups sure. with you, and he's been watching you, and he was absolutely ecstatic that you were coming on the show because he actually watched, he's been on the show before, so John Devine. Um, oh, but sure. uh, What's that? I, I recognize the name. Yeah. John John D Rockefeller on uh he calls himself on uh WhatsApp. Fantastic. Yeah. So but um but I got some really great questions for crypto uh for you. I want to get mm -hmm. into those. Um but before we do I want to touch on one more thing about crypto uh, law partners and just for our audience anybody who needs crypto law advice is welcome to go to crypto law partners. Where do they find you? CryptoLawPartners.com. Uh, I'm I'm easy to find. I'm, I'm loud and clear on Instagram. It's CryptoLawPartners.com. Is easy. You just fill out a, you know the form and say hi. Okay. Um, 
I'm sure they can contact you and get WhatsApp. But you know, people basically people find me on Instagram these days. I know that sounds funny, but I'm pretty and loud and clear. On does crypto law partners actually advise the sovereign crypto fund of Dubai? Uh, I, I couldn't answer that question. You can't answer that question. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's move on to some real questions. Let, 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 put, let me put it this way. I have an extremely strong theoretical and practical interest and involvement with regulation of policy. And I really and, I really advise everybody to check out your YouTube channel because I did watch some of your YouTube interviews and they're very informative, very, very yeah. informative. And for anybody who wants to know the cutting edge of what's going on in crypto, uh, there's your guy right here. So, um, but but that's really cool. So uh, you are advising policy in Dubai, helping out with the structure. And Africa. And in Africa. Interesting. You know, then I'm going to just jump ahead to a different question. I had so many sure. questions. I'm going to just uh, jump to, um, since we're talking about advising policy, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you, uh, one of my... Um, my um, friends asked a question. They wanted to know what you think is the future of the U.S. and the U.S. Uh, money supply after ISO 2022 migration. The 200, 200 migration. Of course, the cleaning people just knocked on the door. Um, I mean, I may have to yell at the cleaning people to not come in because they just decided to ring the second. Yeah. The let me let me comment about the U.S. generally. Okay. The I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not happy to say this, but the 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 U.S. dollar has long been in a death spiral, but that spiral is increasing its path of descent, if you like. The I think. It's really sad to see it. I, I, I don't think the U.S. is going to do well in the long term. I could be wrong. I'm not happy about it. Uh, it, it may get by just because everyone else will do worse. But it's, I, 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 it's just not where I see entrepreneurial activity taking place. The, and, and so with the money supply and everything else, they're, they're just going to keep on printing more money. They can't not print more money. Mm -hmm. You know, 2008 never ended, the, the crisis of that period. Mm -hmm. And we've just been hobbling along ever since then, patching and and hoping. And we we moved from a real based economy, I say, to a finance based economy. The and th there's a, an expression I use, which is when when I was growing up, I was looking forward to the physical future, whether it's flying cars or robots or things that were different now, now we have a future based on the screen mm -hmm. okay the, the the thing that you know whether it's twitter or instagram or youtube or whatever it is our, our futures or even in virtual reality our futures are based on these little devices i don't see too much of the physical future and you can tell which country is going to do well in my opinion by seeing who's building the physical future mm -hmm. and i see china doing that okay i see the middle east doing that um, I don't see Germany doing that. That was very surprising and very disappointing when I was there. I was like, I always have my mind, like, you know, yeah. Germany being this cutting edge country, it, it doesn't seem to be doing that right now. And I, I don't see the United States building the physical future. Mm -hmm. I, see, I see the infrastructure and the buildings just kind of rotting away and all this woke stuff being taught in the schools, mm -hmm. you know, you know, decolonizing mathematics rather than actually teaching mathematics. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's like, it, it, you, you have no idea how radically conservative the world's becoming and like dollar this dollar that <laughs> bless you you know long long term the u.s is not going to go great so and, and, um, and the, the, the answer to the question more specifically we're just gonna keep on printing money we can't not print yeah. money i don't, I don't the, think the fed go ahead no go ahead you, you don't think the fed i want to get your... the, the, the the fed is not in a position to stop the amount of squeezing that we require to truly deaden inflation is not something we can politically handle and stay together as a country. Correct. Um, a lot of speculation right now is going on about USDCs. Um, USDT, know, probably. 
uh, not the USD. The USC. Uh, what is? What are they calling the the one that uh, uh, the Federal Reserve is going to issue? The US stable coin that the US oh, wants. The CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. Exactly. So a lot of people are are have been commenting that the reason why the U.S. wants to pivot and and introduce an electric digital currency is mm -hmm. because the game on the Federal Reserve has run out on printing physical money, and this is a way that they could kick the can down for another twenty to thirty years. What are your comments on that? I, I, I'd say that's not the case. the The vast majority of money isn't printed. Okay, it, it's not in, it's not in coin form, and it's not in physical paper form, the vast, vast, vast majority of money is merely electronic bookkeeping entries. And it, and it has been for a long time. You mean like a long, long time? No, I mean, just just the entries in bank registers managed by the Federal Reserve. Okay, it, the, the amount of dollars in circulation are not the amount of dollars that are printed. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, it hasn't been for a long time. Right? It, it's, it's an illusion that the amount of dollars in circulation equals the amount of physical cash okay, yeah. that, that it hasn't been case for a long time, if, especially with fractional reserve banking. It, it's, it's banks reconciling their databases. Mm -hmm. right, so we're, we're, we're already, already now and have been for a long time uh, in the era of digital money and of electronic money. You don't, you know, when you pay with Apple Pay, okay, no, no one's moving physical dollar bills around, even on the back end, okay, from one vault to another. Okay, it's it's just electronic entries, right? And that are mediated by a trusted third party, including mm -hmm. the Federal Reserve System. Okay, so don't we're already with electronic money. The the what CBDCs do, uh, central bank digital currencies, is they centralize. They do a few things. They and the, the definition of it is not entirely clear, but you centralize the bookkeeping of that process. And maybe decentralize the control of that process. So, for example, right, if if I have a million dollars in my bank account, right, my bank account has that record, and that bank account record is, is checked and regulated by the authorities. But with a central bank digital currency, that million dollars would be an entry on a central government database, not a bank's database. Right. Right. And when I transfer it from party A to party B, the central bank, the government, will handle that transfer. It won't go through the banking system. Now, what happens if the government says, I don't like you? That's what uh, my next that. question was going to be. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, they, they obviously very, have, they, yeah, they are going to have complete visibility. Yeah, they, they can, uh, they, they just flip a switch. And if they really like you, can they also just turn you on and give you unlimited slush funds for whatever you want? Right, we, we, well, we call that a bank, by the way. <laughs> okay, because so, bank, 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 bank Favorite banks borrow at extremely low interest rates from yeah. the government and reloan it based on the fractional reserve system. So they get a multiplier effect and they earn an interest on the interest on the interest. Interesting. And so, if, you know, it's good, it's good to be the bank. Um, the CBDCs, in, in my opinion, are, you know, the, we, we used to have the separation of church and state. Yeah. We, we, we need, we, back when gold was gold and it was worth something separate from the government, you had the separation of money and state. Mm. All right. And then we, unfortunately, CBDCs represent the ultimate fusion of money in the state. Interesting. You literally, I mean, if you're China and you don't like someone, if you don't like Falun Gong, you just turn off their wallets, you freeze their wallets. Mm. And you combine that with the, with the social credit system where they can't use the train and they can't get into a school and they have to wait for medical treatment, but they can't even pay for it anyway. And you got, you, got, you, got, you got a soft form of murder. Uh-huh. Cancel culture okay. at a, at the highest level. That yeah, actually, I mean, we, the, I'm I'm going to yeah. announce the different people who ask these questions. So Sarah asks, um, mm -hmm. how do how do you think small players like us will be able to cash out on their crypto after the implementation of CBDC? And are they going to be able? Do you believe that they will be able to re withdraw in the U.S. if they are non-compliant? Or do you think that the government will put restrictions on specific people? Um, I, I, I think that the U.S. is heading to a financial crisis, which is going to cause them to become very strict and unreasonable. Uh -huh. And even though they may not have the right to do things that they're going to do, the fact that they don't have the right to do it isn't going to stop them from doing it. Because in practical effect, we, the citizens, are not in a position to 
stand united against them and get a timely resolution of our issues. So for, I'll give you a standard example. If you're accused of a crime or not even necessarily a crime, the government can seize your property, not by beyond a reasonable doubt standard, but just by a preponderance of the evidence or sometimes even a preliminary showing. It's called an in rem warrant, a warrant against property. So if you're living abroad, you haven't done anything wrong, but the government wants to mess with you, they can go to the Southern District Court in New York. They can appear before a judge without you there, or you got some notice, but there's some notice requiring you to fly back, you know, or sometimes the stuff's even secret because they, you know, they want to make sure you don't scond with your own money. You can get an in rem warrant. And now that property is tied up in the legal system. Now, on some superficial level, you have the ability to hire a judge and sorry, hire a lawyer and free that stuff up. But in real life, that's years and money, and they're, the government has the government's resources, and citizens have whatever they have. And it's hard to pay for a lawyer when the money that you can use to pay for the lawyer is subject to an in rem warrant. Uh -huh. They know this. Okay, they, they freeze your assets and they go hire a lawyer, free them up. Well, how do I pay my lawyer? So there's theoretical law, theoretical law and there's practical law. At, at a practical level, you need to move your assets and your life beyond the, the reach of avaricious individuals who happen to work for the government. Okay, you know, they, these are all people, and these people are not necessarily nice. And, and the standards of due process and everything else that we used to have very strong in the U.S. Mm -hmm. aren't quite as strong as they used to be, clearly. And there's mm -hmm. political stuff and there's racial stuff. It's just like, eh. So I, my suggestion to Sarah, I think it was, was yeah. get a second passport, diversify your assets, don't shout, don't scream, and just kind of go, go dark. For a while. Now, for a while. Now, the, the, the trick is how do you go dark when you want to make a difference in the world, build families, build businesses, build wealth, build better communities? And the answer is, is tricky. I don't, I'm, I'm trying to figure that out myself. Mm -hmm. right? Sarah, Sarah also asks in follow-up, she gave me a list of these questions. She got really excited. To, we we to like hear. Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. We like Sarah a lot. She asked, we like Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> Where is the safest place to hodl your assets? Is it a cold wallet? And she also asked about the French ledger company. Um, it's, it's definitely an offline wallet. You do not want the majority of your crypto with an exchange. We're seeing that with FTX. Hopefully, we won't see it with Binance. Uh, I think Binance is stable, but you know, the thing about this is. Even if it is stable, if enough people withdraw from the bank all at once, even the bank has assets, they can run into problems distributing those assets or calling in its other loans or working through it. Um, you should always keep the vast majority of your crypto in the air-gapped cold storage wallet, no exceptions. Um, okay, and it doesn't matter if it's Coinbase or this or that. I mean, the exchanges are potentially good for engaging in transactions. So you can move from your cold wallet to your exchange account and then engage in your transactions. And then when you have your transactions complete, you pull back off the exchange. Or you, if the technology keeps on developing like it is, you start working with a decentralized exchange, a DEX. Right. You know, that's obviously a good way to do it so long as the code behind the DEX is good. But, you know, these DEXs do get hacked, so they're not, they're not perfect. But you absolutely, you know, want a ledger or some other cold wallet uh, to hold your crypto no exceptions and um that actually that what what cold wallet do you re recommend what's your wallet of choice there's a bunch but ledger is fine uh -huh. i watched Mr. Uh, sorry but yeah, the, the, the trick there is then you, you need to be mindful to not lose it you need to be mindful to not lose your, your key to it because right. once it's gone it's gone, it's gone um me. you need to be aware of issues like you can get physically threatened it's called a wrench attack you know, um, there's, you know, what happens if you die? What happens if you get injured? You know, do you, you know, you've got $20 million in your cold wallet and you're married with kids and you love your wife and you love your family and, you know, you die. What, what, how do they get that 20 million? They, they can't sure unless they you have need... the passcodes. Right. And then what happens if you get divorced? So, you know, there, life, life gets Very complicated. There, there, there's, there's maybe some reason for set up two wallets. Your money. But... Put one some of your money in one wallet and some of your money in another wallet. Well, it's smartly people smarter than both you and I are working on this. There's multi-signature. There's this, you know, maybe some estate planning tools you can use with this stuff, but you you, you got to think it through. Um, the 
ideally you, you, you'd have a jurisdiction where you didn't have these in-rim warrants, you didn't have this sort of avaricious government where you could truly trust the system to hold your stuff. If you really, really are dead to distribute it a certain way, you know, to, to act in a legally appropriate way. I, Ironically enough, the, the, the free zones in, in the Emirates and around here that use English common law, in my opinion, are to some extent more reliable, more efficient than U.S. courts. Mm -hmm. U.S. courts are scary. Yeah, you know, they're a little. They're, I mean, they sued Alex Jones for two point seven five trillion dollars. How is that even real? You know that, is. despite what anybody thinks about the case or Sandy Hook or any of the stuff, when you see a court giving a, an, a settlement for larger than the GDP of Russia, you got to like question what's going on in the U.S. court system to allow that kind yeah. of stuff to behave. Well, ho hopefully that all gets reduced on appeal. But yeah, but, you know, but then you have to appeal. Yeah, which is expensive you know, and it's a whole process. And yeah, now, you know, does he have those assets? Of course not. It's, 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 it's all just right. a big joke. It's right. a political statement. And um, look, it. it these are this, getting back to the original point I made. These are all traditional about the store of cold storage. Well, let me, let me just say this: this stuff about you know how do you manage your courts? How do you manage your assets? How do you how do you plan for this stuff? These are traditional legal conundrums that we've been struggling with for thousands of years. You mm -hmm. know, do you trust the system? Do you trust law? Do you trust humans? What what blend of that works? When I was originally saying that law will benefit from crypto and blockchain, and not just the other way around. I, th I think that there's software and technical tools to make law more deterministic, more knowable, mm. more planable, more safe. Um, you know, when you when you have contracts that are deterministic, that are based on code and not just on human interpretations of vague English language, right. of, of human language, um, where numbers have clear meanings and aren't you know subject to some judge's lack of math skills. Right. Um, you you can actually make much better law. Much more efficient law. You can make computational law. You can make international law because you know programming in Python is the same whether you're in China or the U.S. or Canada. Right. So th th this this is why I'm in this field because the, the even though I'm a lawyer, the revulsion I have towards um, the misapplication and unfairness and inconsistency the, the way that law is done, you know, originally made me not practice law, but now drove me back into it because I want to fix it using blockchain and crypto. So I just want to get that idea across the audience that. If you're if you if you're one of those people that's of of a builder mindset, uh, one thing to, to look at is how do you make human systems more reliable and noble and predictable and efficient so that we can progress forward and not have these uncertainties because they affect our liberty. Right. So cold storage wallets yeah. are the way to go. That's the. Oh sure. I mean, you, you do, do not have your funds on exchange. Period. Do not have anything on an exchange right now. Oh, you, you can have something, but I saw uh, with the collapse of FTX, I saw Mr. Mm -hmm. Wonderful um, give a uh, a testimony, and he really said that I I don't know if he's just like an angry investor into FTX, or do you believe him when he says that Binance kind of like strategically took FTX down, or is he just we're talking about Leary, Dennis Leary? Yeah, or who Dennis, are we talking about? Dennis O'Leary. It's like I barely watch him. He always he, he never did it for me. Um he, if, if no, I don't believe it. I mean, you know, if, if you FTX was a co was a scam. It was it was a total they, they uh, commingling kind funds. They had no internal controls. I mean, he had no look controls at the, over the book. Look at them. I know. I mean, look at that woman who's running Alameda. It's just like, oh my God. And then you read, you read your private emails. You're like, oh God, cringe. It, it's like, you know, it's they're, so they're, they're dealing with money that, if properly deployed, could build cities. Okay. I mean, or we're dealing with money that could have trained tens of thousands of engineers. Right. You know, and it's, and it's all just, they're not cool. They're not hip. Like I, 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 I love young entrepreneurial energy. I don't knock it, and I, and I think every generation, everyone, has a kind of class to come in there, you know, say f you to the system, change the way things are done, you know, see jobs or whoever. Um, 
and God bless him. But to be an iconoclastic and nonconformist, just to put up a show, which is what I think they were doing, and just to kind of stick it to the system without having a viable alternative, it, it, you know, it, it's what we all get excited about. Like, look at these ruffians. They showed up to meet with the VCs in, in a pajamas. They really showed them who's boss. Yay. It's like, you know, that Zuckerberg thing. It's like, give me a break. I, you know, I don't care about that stuff. I want to go to Mars. Right. You know, exactly. And how much, how much of the positive forward momentum of what the crypto and blockchain has to offer dissipates because of these fools at Celsius and FTX and the rest of it. It makes me sick. And yeah, I don't want them to be regulated. I, I want this stuff to be written in, in code. Do you think that the regulation, do you think that this whole thing is a controlled collapse to kind of like allow the Fed and the SEC to say, oh, look, we need regulations on crypto. And so they kind of, like if you look at the connections between Gary Gensler and uh, and Sam Bigman fried and Caroline and all, it's a very incestuous little circle there. I mean, in, in more ways than one. The, in more ways than no, one. No, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think. No, I mean, sometimes conspiracies end up being real, but a spiritual mindset is usually a sign of a, you know, a problem in the person who has that mindset. The, no, I, I, I don't, I don't think it's some big orchestrated thing. I think that you had some weird relationships. I think you had a ton of donations to Democratic political people. Right. You know, you had the New York Times. You know, writing weird softball articles about how Sam Bankman Fried's, you know, uh, philanthropic ventures were taken down by his, you know, it's like, no, no, he's a he's a criminal and a thief and a jerk, actually. Have you met him? So casual. No, he's a jerk for taking in so much of, of other people's money and treating right. it in the cavalier, non serious manner. That's a cavalier way, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't need to meet him until he's a jerk. Yeah, no, he's yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't need to go to Mongolia to know that Mongolia exists. Yeah. Okay. You know, it, you don't need to go to Mongolia to have Mongolian beef, man. That is one dish, man. Give me some Mongolian yes. beef. Waiter, please, give, Mongolian give, beef yeah. over here. Yeah, give me some of that, you know, yak action. But the, the, no, the, I mean, we're, we're talking about, go speaking, ahead. Speaking of the FTX collapse, Vegas just yeah. announced a, um, crypto predictions for the um the next crypto collapse and i wanted to get your take on this because i think it's quite alarming that they're putting up these bets odds on which crypto uh is going which crypto <laughs> exchange is going to collapse these are actual bets going on in vegas right now and coinbase is obviously the 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 best odds of staying Binance. They are saying that Coinbase is, is Vegas is saying Coinbase. I think that this is a great way to kind of gauge the safety and security of different exchanges that Coinbase is the safest and crypto.com is the, is the most risky. So what do you, what, what's your thoughts on that? I think it's pretty funny. Um, it is funny, but there's you... money being transferred and gambled on this assumption. So uh, I, it, begs no, the, it begs the mind to be inquisitive. The yes, it does. I mean, these these prediction markets are freaky because they often end up being extremely right in ways that you wouldn't expect. the The danger is that sometimes the prediction market actually ends up influencing actual events in a way that those events wouldn't necessarily unfold in the absence of a prediction market. So, you know, if, if everyone believes, if, if a prediction market, is, it's one thing to think a bank is going to collapse, but if, if a prediction market predicts that bank is going to collapse and people start spending or gaining or losing money based on that, it can actually make the bank collapse mm -hmm. when the bank wouldn't have necessarily collapsed before. Right. Like the prediction markets actually affect the events that they're predicting. So, you know, it's like, ugh. You know, yeah. on one hand, they're super, you know, they, they kind of become self fulfilling prophecies. It, 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 re it reinforces the idea that you, you need to be self custodying your crypto. Now, unfortunately, that slows adoption, right? Because the people who can set up a Coinbase account are not necessarily the same people who can maintain a cold wallet. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we're all, you know, operating with, you know, you know, a, a Chinese kid can do it when he's two years old, but, you know, you show an American 18 year old and they're like, uh, you know, Wait, you mean I actually have to read the instructions? Mm -hmm. So, you know, self custody, self custody is a fantastically simple action, but it, it's hard for people who 
don't have the attention to watch a three minute video. So, you know, when you do self custody, you're unfortunately going to cut it back on, on adoption, but it's the safest thing to do. And I, in, until we have truly reliably regulated exchanges in countries that don't avariciously smack down and seize crypto, mm -hmm. you, you got to keep it off the, the market. And, you know, it, it's, it's sad because when you have crypto on exchanges, you have a lot of liquidity, you can get accurate price discovery, you can, you know, don't need to have, um, you don't need to have, know the person you're selling to or go right. through an over-the-counter facility. But we're seeing what happens. You know, they've got drugs like FTX. What do you think about HBAR's claim on their website that they're owned by the U.S. government? I don't even know about that. Tell me. You don't know, I, I don't know much about it either. It's one of the questions from the audience that uh, um, HBAR, HBAR supposedly claims on their website that they're owned and governed by the U.S. government. I don't know if that's true or not. Could be not true. Well, uh, let's do a little Google. Maybe they're referring to something else. Huh? I love technology that if you don't have an answer to a, a problem, you just turn your head, Google, and... Hedera Global Governing Council, maybe? Oh, maybe, maybe HBAR is working on digital... Okay, Hedera... Rumor. I, I just Googled it, by the way. It says, this is from 21. Rumor. Hedera, HBAR, working on digital dollar with Central Bank. I wouldn't say, I, I don't think Hedera is owned by the U.S. government. I'd love to get a link saying that. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of these projects are owned by the U.S. government. So moving on with, with that, you know, there's not mm. so much that differentiates each individual coin. A lot of people are predicting the end of the, uh, of BTC and Ethereum, you know, a lot of people are thinking that the bottom is a lot further down than than uh, than than people would like to have seen. Uh, what what do you think? Do you think we've reached the bottom of BTC, or is is there still yet bottom to to happen? Okay, there, there, there's two separate. Let me unpack what you said because you, you probably saw my body language. Yeah, the, um, the end of the stuff. Hardly. Mm -hmm. What does end mean? Is the you know the, is the Bitcoin network going to stop functioning? No. Okay. Well, people keep on mining to produce proof of work and validating transactions and creating new Bitcoin. I really doubt it. Okay. The remember the the Bitcoin uh, mining complexity algorithm self adjusts. So mm -hmm. that new Bitcoin blocks come out every 10 minutes or so. So if there's a lack of hashing power on the network for a certain period of time, the mining algorithm gets easier. So it's to incent miners to stay in the game. It takes less effort to earn Bitcoin. When more and more miners come on and blocks are getting mined too quickly, like less than 10 minutes for a consistent period of time, the complexity, the difficulty of the algorithm goes up. So there, there's <clears throat> Sadoshi and crew we're very clever in designing Bitcoin so that even if there's moments where it looks like the miners are capitulating and not doing their mining, if you stick it out, it gets easier and you make more Bitcoin. Mm. Okay. And it, it, and if Bitcoin wasn't dead last time at 500, why would it be dead now at 16,000? Why? Is it, you know, it, 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 if the algorithm can make it progressively easier to mine it. Yeah. So that That's people great. stay interested, you know, it makes sense. It, the, the same that it's dead or has a problem. Makes so sense. the answer is Bitcoin and ETH are not dying. They're just well, you know, the, the, they're different animals. So let me, let me tease it out. The you know, uh, ET, BT, BTC might have a problem because the, the technology is a bit stagnant. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that makes it reliable. You know, a lot of the stuff changes a lot. Now, now getting to Ethereum, case in point, the technology changed. Right, it, it was proof of work. And now it's proof of stake. And so it may have gone from something that people generally agreed was not a security. Maybe to, maybe it became something that's a security. Maybe now it's being run in a fuzzy, strange way that's environmentally friendly, but it's not quite as rigorous as Bitcoin was. But then again, now we're burning Ethereum in some cases. So it's deflationary. So you know, I think we're, we're building cool stuff on Ethereum. There's a huge development community out there. It, it, it seems to yeah. matter. 
So I, I, don't, I don't, in my opinion, crypto's time hasn't passed. I, things like AI and all this other stuff are certainly interesting. And people are like, oh, I'm well, leaving crypto, I'm going to AI. The illusion that these things don't all work together to me is funny. Right. They do work together. Right. Yeah, of course. I mean, genetics and, and, and biotech work with this stuff. You just I can't you know, imagine the first blocks. AI cities are not going to be built on blockchain technology. Yeah. Now the question was, are they going to use cryptocurrency? I don't I don't know, but are they going to use blockchain? 100 percent Do you think that uh Bitcoin will ever be safe to be used in DeFi? Um, that's a really good and technically complex question. So that that's a question from Robert, actually. Robert asks, uh, I'll read his full question to you and you can address it. What are the risks of Ethereum being labeled as a security? As I believe BTC is the backbone of most cryptocurrencies in general. We mainly got WBTC we can use in DeFi. I suppose we got smart contract risks do we know how safe this is? Will there be safer implementations and will Bitcoin ever be able to be safely used in DeFi? Okay, so the, we, we question, like Robert. Right? Well, fantastic questions. Okay, let, let me take a step by step. All right. There was a general consensus that Ethereum was sufficiently decentralized. Gensler himself said this in his Gary Plastics speech. You can Google it. Gensler said in Gary Plastics, um, I think it was privately to Yahoo, that Ethereum appeared to be sufficiently decentralized that even if it had started off as a security, it probably wasn't a security now. Because when you when you have a security, you need what's called a, a common enterprise. That's one of the four prongs of the Howey test, which is the most famous legal test for whether or not something is a security. You know, investment money for a profit in a common enterprise where the efforts are from the result of that, where the profits are from the result of the efforts of others. If you don't have, if something's decentralized, you don't have a common enterprise. So there's an argument that Ethereum and Bitcoin were not were on proof of work, which is decentralized, and so it's not a security. Now Ethereum has moved over to proof of stake. So rather than mining and, and solving complex math problems to publish each new block, there is a consensus on the network about what's right and what's wrong, and you basically bet or stake your Ethereum to back up that you're going to be a good actor on the network. Well, that, that kind of creates an opportunity for collusion and centrality of control that didn't exist before. So Ethereum may be a security, but I think on a practical level, it would be so disruptive and so negative for the industry to make it a security that the SEC may hold back on, on Ethereum, but not hold back on others. Now, to your next question, DeFi is 99% built on Ethereum and Ethereum-like chains. So whether it's Ethereum itself, whether it's um, Binance Smart Chain, whether it's all these Ethereum copies, Ethereum is, sorry, uh, DeFi decentralized finance is sort of Ethereum baby and, you know, and, and, and also progeny. You can do basic scripting on the Bitcoin blockchain, but you do not have the rich smart contract, as far as I understand it, uh, logic that's available on Ethereum and it's more or less accurate copies. So DeFi certainly lends itself to Ethereum much more than it lends itself to Bitcoin. Now, a lot of the value, the majority of the, of the crypto value out there is in Bitcoin still until there's the flipping between Ethereum and Bitcoin. So to unlock the liquidity as in Bitcoin, of course, you have wrapped Bitcoin. You have, you know, you deposit your Bitcoin with some trusted entity, you think, and they issue an Ethereum-based token, a WBTC, wrapped Bitcoin, in place of that Bitcoin. And then when you have wrap Bitcoin, this Ethereum token that's equivalent to Bitcoin, then you can use that to make deposits or engage in decentralized finance transactions. But of course, there's an issue there, which is when you deposit your Bitcoin with someone else and get a wrapped version back, you're now trusting that institution to hold on to your Bitcoin, not give it to government, not go bankrupt, not pull you know, an FTX, a Sam Bankman fried move. And actually keep that Bitcoin safe, keep it wrapped, and make it exchangeable back when you want to. And you're having to go through your KYC, you know, your customer process, usually when you wrap your Bitcoin. So you're, you're going back to having to trust institutions and centrality, you know, things that are points of attack for malicious actors. And sometimes the malicious actor is the institution itself. We saw that with FTX. FTX right. wasn't attacked from the outside. FTX was the malicious actor. Right. Um, 
you know, if, if CZ from Binance points out that they're a malicious actor, that doesn't make it CZ bad. Right? He's just pointing out reality, right? So if we're gonna have truly strong regulated institutions that stand apart from the government or in a jurisdiction where the government behaves and knows what's right, issuing reliable wrapped Bitcoin, then I would hope that that liquidity could get it unlocked. Mm -hmm. um, then of course you have the usual issues about you know, whether your DeFi platform is secure. We keep on seeing hack after hack after hack of these DeFi platforms. So my hope and goal is that the contracts will eventually become machine ridden and mm -hmm. well vetted so that these tools become reliable. Um, but they're not there yet. But you know, I, I, I've played with this idea of wrapped Bitcoin. I, I'd like, to, I'd really like to see somehow the Bitcoin networks and Ethereum networks merge in a non-hacky, reliable way. Interesting. So that there was some kind of native functionality that I could trust. Maybe there's some project out there I don't know about. If you needed there's some native, you know, polychain functionality that can move assets back and forth between these chains in a way that did not require a third party intermediary that was just computationally secure. Maybe right. that exists and I haven't seen it, but th that would be the real answer. But it seems like the two are inextricably bound that, that BTC is almost nothing with F in that, with, in that case, you know, that you could trade a native BTC on AMM or CLOB or D uh, or DEX. And without the two, you, the functionality just, is not there. So it's almost like BTC and ETH kind of go hand in hand at some point. Yeah. Would you agree? It should go hand in hand. The, um, and I know that Michael Saylor, he explains that ETH, ETH is really the security, whereas BTC is the commodity. And do you know, did you hear him talk about that? So it, it, it is the consensus. It is the consensus in the world right now, including the United States, that Bitcoin is a commodity. Uh, Michael, it is no, in no way the consensus that Ethereum is a commodity it, or a security. It is subject to active debate. Mm -hmm. And I come down on the side that Ethereum is barely not a security, but they really expose themselves to danger by going to prove a stake, though I certainly understand why they did it, including for environmental reasons. Mm -hmm. um, they... You know, it's not necessarily the case that these things need to merge BTC and Ethereum for the benefit of humanity. Sometimes there's benefits in keeping things separate. Maybe Bitcoin, all it's meant to do is provide a reliable um, way to store value over time. And it's sort of backward nature is good in a way because you don't want to innovate with things that are storing your value. You just want your value. Maybe that's good. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is there's just so much value there that right. it'd be nice to get that working in the financial markets through the Ethereum tools. But you know, maybe maybe there needs to be an, a truly effective smart contract layer on top of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Who knows? I mean, it, it, Bitcoin development is kind of stalled out, in my opinion. It's a, kind of it's a little bit of a shame, but I understand. But it's, it's also maybe a feature because it's, it makes it a little bit more reliable. Mm -hmm. It's also, uh, you know, it's it's it as a practical commodity. Ethereum is just traded so much more than than Bitcoin for basic transactions. Just from what I see, I mean, MetaMask uses Ethereum, not Bitcoin, for for all of its functions. And you know, Bitcoin just has this, from my experience, has slower hashes. So, but to kind of they're, 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 remember, they're doing two different things. You don't you don't want to compare an elephant with an eagle. Interesting. Okay, they're, 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 not, they're not meant to do the same thing. It's like you, you don't compare a foot and a hand. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, Ethereum is doing smart contracts. Bitcoin is storing and transmitting value. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I don't need to be trans storing and transmitting value as much as I need to do day-to-day -day computational work. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to do all that while they're separate. And, and Ethereum is kind of a muddied situation because it's meant to power these smart contracts, yet the token has value. So people use it as an investment. It's, it's a confusing thing. Like, is it this or is it this? And the, and the fact that it fluctuates up and down based on investment interest actually interferes with its ability to be a good source. Of, yeah. Or to, to power these smart contracts. 
Mm-hmm. I because there's a real period where the fees on the Ethereum network were so high and intolerable, and it was so slow and congested that you couldn't really get anything done on Ethereum, whereas Bitcoin didn't have that issue. So where do you see? I, yeah, I understand. Where do you see with all the different coins that are out there and everything, all the different values that each one has? Who do you see uh, emerging as like a true stable coin that the market could bank on as a stable, as a more stable, uh, as a more stable coin? Is it HBAR? Is it XLM? Is it, you know? So let's, let's be real clear. There's stable coins and not stable coins are just, you know, when you have a stable coin, what, you, what you're saying is that this thing, this thing is going to be consistently exchangeable for something out for something else at a set ratio, if you like, over time. There needs to be some reference asset. Okay, so USDT, US dollar token, or USDC, the US dollar coin, are mapped, we think, one-to-one with the US dollar. And they're sort of euro equivalents. Okay, and... Or you can theoretically have a stable coin that's, you know, that's exactly references one gram of 99.99% gold, right? right. It, it, it's always in reference to something else, mm-hmm. right? To have, to have a stable coin that's not reference to anything else doesn't make any sense. It's not stable versus what, mm-hmm. right? So I think, I hope, I think um, USDT and USDC are reasonably reliable and trustworthy. There's always a question about these, both of them for different reasons. Whether it's USDT having true dollars backing up their their tokens or USDC, you know you can, they can block and freeze wallets and transactions. It's or USDT and can also mm-hmm. we, we already have pretty good stable coins that are asset backed. Um, what uh, Terra was trying to do with USD um, or the Terra dollar before was having an algorithmic stable coin mm-hmm. that not just through strict backing, but through mechanisms of the market was going to have a consistent value over time. Algorithmic stable coins are very hard to make and hard to keep in place over time because the, you know things happen, black swans occur. Mm-hmm. So it's, I don't, I don't, theoretically it can, it can happen. I don't know if it will happen. When you're talking about something like BTC, it's not a stable coin. BTC doesn't exist in reference to anything else, nor does Ethereum. It just is. It's, BTC is not meant to be an alternative dollar, alternative gold. Okay, it doesn't even know those things exist. You know, it's just it's just a computer program running a bunch of computers. I, I think once we wrap our heads around the idea that it's not that BTC is worth something in dollars, it's that dollars is worth something in BTC. That that BTC is the reference point, like we kind of think that US dollars are the reference point right now. Then it'll become stable because one BTC will always equal one BTC. And everything will be traded in reference to it. It would be how many barrels of oil can you get for one for one Bitcoin? Right. right. So th- that, that's a more macro play. When when BTC Bitcoin becomes the one point of reference, everything else will get priced in BTC. Whether that's actually gonna happen in real life, I don't know. It's highly questionable, but I, I hope it happens. So with so many it, it is something that I think everybody hopes happens that BTC becomes the the basis for the entire system but with so many different coins and and so many of them they they do so many of very similar features but with slight differences Mm -hmm. what what coins do you see stick out in the market and and what are their real values what what are the what are the coins that that you're most uh fond of these days well there there there's coins that are this cryptocurrency and then there's tokens that do stuff. Mm-hmm. Cryptocurrency is to you know buy and sell and hold value and and just act as a replacement for fiat. In my mind, for the most part, Bitcoin is the only game in town, mm-hmm. unless you're looking at privacy's functionality, like for example with Monero. I was going to ask you about Monero. Yeah, Monero is having a renaissance now because as governments get overreaching. Uh, People are kind of like, I don't want you to follow what I'm doing. You know, privacy is a normal human value. And that, and this whole thing about if you have nothing to hide, you might as well share it is a bunch of BS, okay? The, gover- the government, you know, it's always the people, ha- you know, when, when the police say that, you're like, fine, you send me all your personal information. Well, I'm not that, you know, I'm the one asking questions here. They never reciprocate, mm-hmm. you know, when they say if you have nothing to hide, tell us everything. It's like, well, fine, you too. 
Oh, really? Is that your wife? Is that your girlfriend? So the Bitcoin is by far, BTC is by far the best cryptocurrency. And I'd love to see Monero type privacy incorporated in it. Um, we kind of can get that through Tumblr and through this other stuff, but the US government's being nasty to that, like Tornado Cash and other platforms. But th that would be the ideal situation. Distinguish that in your mind from tokens, mm -hmm. okay, such as Ethereum token or Ethereum copy tokens. Those may have value because they're useful, but they're not designed primarily to have value. They're designed to power gain access to what these blockchains, these underlying blockchains offer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ethereum's value is a side effect of its functionality and what people think it's going to do in the future, plus speculation to make, you know, make more money than the next guy. Yeah. Right. But it, it's not I when I when I look at these coins and when these chains, my, my fundamental question is what are these blockchains doing now? What will they do in the future? Is that useful? Would I pay for that? And that thing that I'm going to use to pay for it, what are the economics of that thing? It's like it's like a country. It's like, you know, if, if I go to Dominican Republic, do I want to go there? Do I want to stay in a hotel there? Do I want to eat the food there? Or do, or do I want to go to Ecuador? Okay, these, you know, and if I want to go to Dominican Republic, then the currency they use there becomes more interesting to me because I need it to spend there. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to Ecuador, the, that currency becomes more interesting to me because I want to go there and spend there, right? And so it's like, oh, Ecuador is nice, but look at this. They you know, are printing double the amount of pesos every year. Well, that affects my decision to buy it, even if I want to go to Ecuador. So it's the value. You sense it, like Each one of these blockchains is its own country. And you can choose which country to visit. And yeah. all these countries are competing against each other with the features and benefits. Do you, and have, then, you, know, do you have a favorite country to visit, token-wise? I am a frequent flyer. So yeah, I like, I like frequent flyer uh, of many different tokens and many different airlines. I, I, I am, and you, you know what? I, I, I like it. I mean, just to extend the analogy. I like it when these countries hire me, fly me out, put me up in hotels, and pay me in their in their token. That's and then cool. I don't, that's I, very they, you cool. Know, that that's I, I I'm not a big fan of buying stuff. I'm a fan of getting paid. That's uh that's actually very cool. So I have um. One more question, two more questions for you, actually. Sure. Um, the the one who the one of my followers who's uh, in three groups with you, Kryptonite Warriors, Axe Capital, and NFT yeah. DeFi. Out yeah, of those, yeah, sure. out of these three groups, what do you? What is your favorite out of these three groups? You really think I'm going to do that? Because I know the, who runs each one of these groups. How do I get myself in these groups? This is what my real question is. Well, then I can, I can introduce you and add you. That's that's not a problem. Then. Okay. Uh, are we going to start a happy hour? Active. Is there going to be a happy hour mafia crypto group for the old school? In Dubai, I'm not doing anything called happy hour or mafia. <laughs> exactly. So, so that would be kind of a mistake. It, it, it's it's more, more like good boys and girls in Dubai. So, so my um, last... yeah, go ahead. I mean, why not join all? I'll join all of those. Them. Yeah, in all three I will. To, to, to see what you like. I would you know, love to. to destroy. And I, last... I, I have to say, when I, when, just real fast, when I got here two years ago, I, I'm one of the first guys who started one of these groups. I have UAE Crypto Life. Uh -huh. uh, then I have to say, I got some admiring copycats, but you know, it, I don't have a, I don't have an exclusive on the idea. So well, it's nice I got, to see these I got like. some really good crypto friends. I'm sure they would all love to be in your groups. They were all like super excited about you coming on the show. Some of them I've introduced you to, like my buddy James Smith. Uh, sure. You know, I introduced you to, uh, I think, do you know Jason Toich by any chance? Yeah. I've been trying to get him yeah, to oh, come oh. on. Amazing oh, guys. On. Been, he was a party animal too, that guy. He used to go, that guy, believe it or not, he had some fun back in the day. But my last question that I have for you, um, mm. what kind of strategic advice do you think you could give to serious crypto players who are out there that have their money on cold wallets that are not on the regulated systems that want to avoid taxes? What, how, what is the best strategy um, to how to bring your money back into the system if you were one of the few who got 
to be able to have their money out of the system on time and that they that the money exists outside of the system how do you bring it into the system safely without the irs or governments coming in and trying to snatch up all your booty i'm not going to answer that question because that's asking for it but i'll i'll i'll, I'll say in general um read and look at nomadcapitalist.com and there's also lots of stuff online and at amazon about how to organize your affairs the you want to think about being a sovereign individual that's the name of a book you want to think about five flight theory um most of the time it's not correcting what you did in the past it's planning for your future affairs mm -hmm. okay and i'd say that if you're not american move to dubai and enjoy the tax structure here and if you are American, they don't offer dual citizenship? Well, they do, but you, you as an American are, are taxed on global income regardless of where you reside. Right. Good old, great? good old American socialism at work. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we gotta we gotta protect the oil for someone for some, you know. Yeah. That, don't that, drill the oil. We have to protect it for future future uh for for future Chinese. For future Chinese, exactly. More lithium batteries. So um we covered a variety of topics. This was so rich. Mm -hmm. I would love to have you back on a million times. You are such a wealth of information. And, Thank you know, you. people look at you as a wealth of information of crypto. And it's so nice, you know, to see that. But you're also such a wealth of information for so many other things, you know, including Ukraine, including all these other amazingly important topics of discussion. So we, we'd have, I'd love to get you back on the show for some of those, too, in the future. Sure. Um, but in closing out um what do you see for 2023 in real uh, and, and i don't want to talk about the having in 2024 but 2023 the year before the having like departing wisdom from from the uh, the divine einstein i should coin that you know that should get that should go around the world and people should start introducing you at speaking events as the divine einstein just so i can please get don't. credit for that <laughs> please don't do that um what do you see what is 20 well, I, I i i got some life philosophy that i think answers your question which is always be creatively building okay always be creatively building no matter what crypto up crypto down crypto left crypto right blah 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 blah, blah. it doesn't matter okay always be creatively building always be adding value and getting paid for your value and then you don't need to worry about this stuff. Okay. You don't, I, I'm not in a position to give financial advice. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I, my, my financial advice is earn and keep. Mm. Right. That's because so there's, there, there, there's artificial intelligence out there already that's much smarter than we are when it comes to this trading stuff. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Who, who, who am I to compare to 20, 20 year olds sitting behind screens with algorithms? You know AI informed algorithms that are learning all the time in neural networks. I have nothing to say about that. You know, but I, I'll, I'll tell you something: earn and keep. Do good, get paid for doing good, keep what you make, reinvest. Done. Yalla. That is such a beautiful uh, way to close out the show. Earn, keep, reinvest. I love yeah. that strategy, including yeah. the Yalla Habibi at the end yeah yalla habibi yalla after you're done after you earn and after you keep and you see that statement you say yalla habibi yalla yeah thank you god thank yeah. you god thank you god for this wonderful interview thank you gordon einstein for joining us today on the adam king show i want to thank all of our wonderful listeners the show is moving up and uh you are a phenomenal guest and thank you again so much for all this wonderful advice i'm sure this information is going to go viral in a, in a lot of very important communities where it needs to be heard so uh, once again, please check us out at theadamkingshow.com. You can find Gordon's profile at theadamkingshow.com under the guest tab. And there will be links to Crypto Law Partners or whatever else Gordon wants to share. Hopefully his YouTube channel, which has a, a tremendous wealth of information. Again, everybody have a wonderful Hanukkah. Christmas is coming. So don't get jealous, all you happy Christians out there, because your turn is next. Thank you for tuning into the Adam King Show. God bless and good night, everyone.